Hello, how's everybody doing? You're doing okay? All right. I honestly thought people would be cheerier. I've just, so you can tell that I'm British um, and I'm actually based in the United States. I'm the international director for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, although I hasten to add that this is a personal story that you're about to hear and it isn't the official opinion of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Also, I'm not your lawyer. This isn't an attorney-client privilege. Um, what we say here, um, it has no legal bearing whatsoever. So, I, I have to say, when I came here, I was kind of hopeful. Oh, oh great, we've got, um, we've got my shell. Let's kick up the title. Um, so, I, 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 I rather hoped, after having spent time in what people are referring to as Brexit land with my parents, and then Trump land um, with my work colleagues, that everyone here would be happy because, you know, basically you're the last standing democracy, um, you've got this awesome super state, even the French managed to pull it out of the bag last week. I, I figured that this would be the place where I would be able to have a bit of fun with my, uh, with my uh, digital colleagues. And of course, everybody here is equally as depressed as everywhere else. I've basically spent my time meeting up with um, my old um, veterans in the digital revolution, and everybody's sitting there going, oh, Danny, I don't know what's going on, what are we going to do? Uh, Gert's got some ideas, and maybe we'll be able to do something with that, but, but you know, really, it's all like fake news, and we got a few corporate sponsors, which is nice, but what are we going to do? So, um, my talk is going to be an attempt to sort of pull back a little bit. I'm not coming to kind of... Is this annoying at this point? Maybe I'll go back to my normal, uh, my normal shell. Here we go. And uh, let's do cat... Uh, phosphor.txt. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, I, I'm very interested in history, even the micro histories of uh, the current digital age, you know, histories that last 15 minutes max, because that's roughly our attention span. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the bits that get missed out in histories, the lacuna the sort of gaps in the archaeological record. And I often feel that given that we seem to make the same mistakes again and again, maybe the answer and the response to those mistakes are in those hidden parts of history. Um, I was trying to, I'm old, just so you know, and I, I, I'm constantly trying to uh, work out ways of uh, uh, engaging with young people and one of the ways I talk, to, I talk about this, I talk about a particular form of lacuna that I see, which is that moment just before you enter the political sphere, before you enter into your life, and you come into the world, and the world is built and stable around you, and everything is new to you, but it's clear that it's old to everyone else. And when you do that, it's like walking into a room and a party is already going on, but you don't know what's just happened in that party. Five minutes ago, ten minutes ago, five years ago, ten years ago, there's, there's the historical record, right? You can read it in books. You're probably taught in school that you've just left, what, what happened in the past. And, um, and it's that, that sort of receding edge that bit that hasn't been documented and hasn't been written down, but is clearly on the minds of everybody else in the room that you've just entered. And I was talking to a friend of mine and saying, yeah, like, like, do you ever get that feeling that there's something unsaid about the world that you just entered into? And um, uh, she thought about this for a little bit and said, yeah, SpongeBob SquarePants. Do you, oh, this is tricky. Do you, do you have SpongeBob SquarePants? Uh, I, is it Sponge, SpongeBob Schwartzkopf? <laughs> yeah, okay, good. So she explained to me that as a child growing up, like most things were fairly understandable. You go to school, you learn, you do all of these things, you have cheese sandwiches, it's all comprehensible. They're trying to bring you up into a world. But nobody really explained why anyone thought SpongeBob SquarePants was, was, was educational or like why. Was it a marine biology thing? Was it an attempt? What, what, and like, if you looked around you as a, presumably a seven-year-old critical theorist, she, you know, you, you would be able to draw on material such as like 20 years of The Simpsons and so forth, but no one explained what, what SpongeBob SquarePants was, was reacting. I mean, was it, was it Finding Nemo? Was it a reaction to that? Was it like Marie, was it explanatory? Anyway, I'm not going to talk about SpongeBob SquarePants for the rest of the talk, but I thought it was a good example that might engage the, the 
the young people. Anyway, okay, so, so I, I think that there's something similar, not to SpongeBob, but, but to my lacuna idea happening now, in that if you imagine someone turning up for the first time to um, Republica, they're very excited, they heard it was good last year, but this is their first time, and they turn up here, I don't know, I feel that they, that they, they might feel that they've stumbled in on a wake. Right, because we're all sitting there, and we're going, okay, thanks for coming in. Um, I know that like the books that you read were about how the internet was going to reform everybody, and we we're going to have a non-hierarchical, perfectly distributed, decentralized network. And something happened, and we don't really want to talk about it. But this is where we are now. And um, uh, 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 and, and, you know, I think that, that that's a very hard thing to explain to someone coming in excited and wishing to take part in the digital revolution. Because we've got kind of like Obi-Ben Kenobi levels of denial going on, right? So, so you know, in Obi-Ben Kenobi, in the original good Star, Star Wars, like, Obi is like just making it up as he goes along, as Luke is saying, so what happened in the prequels? And like Obi, like the rest of us, doesn't really want to think about the prequels. And he's sort of going, oh, there was this guy, he wasn't your dad, he kind of looked, he's about your dad's size, a bit shorter maybe, and I mean, he didn't look like your dad, he had a hat, I don't know who he was, he was like, we couldn't recognize him, it was just like, and, and anyway, bad things happened and a bad person did a bad thing and it's nothing to do with me. And that's kind of the situation that we are in with the internet right now. There's a lot of us sitting around and we're sort of going, yeah, um, uh, we were trying to build a revolution. It was going to like distribute everything. It was going to work in an incredibly decentralized way. And then um, a, 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 a bad man happened. Right? A bad man, Mark Zuckerberg, he came and he did a bad thing and now it's all ruined and it's nothing to do with us. So. Um, uh, this is me trying to understand that recent unpleasantness in terms of other lacuna, other unspoken things that are said in the past history of, and I apologize for this as a fellow European, well, fellow ex-European, right? I am going to talk about America because it's sort of still exotic, uh, although... I've just been to Checkpoint Charlie, and I'm always fascinated with America about how it can be simulate simultaneously incredibly popular and incredibly unfashionable at the same time, even in Europe. And, and, and I'm going to do that. So I'm going to talk about American history because, of course, it's the only history there is. Um, so uh, my, my, my title for today, Building a New Net in the Shell of the Old, is actually a phrase from the industrial workers of the world. Now, you've seen people who might have been brought up in the Marxist tradition. Do you know? Has ever, who hands up? Who knows of the industrial workers of the world? The Wobblies. <laughs> right, excellent. For you, I'm not going to apologize because you are obviously really into it. And now I can tell everybody else about how great the Wobblies were. So the Wobblies were, in the early 20th century, the radical wing of the unionist syndicalist movement in the United States. Yes, the United States did have unions. Um, once again, they're kind of in that strange lacuna in that people can't quite remember whether America doesn't have a May Day celebration because that's evil communism or because they invented it and then everyone stole it, right? So um, uh, in the early days of unions, the unions were trying to work out what kind of revolution they were, wanted. And the Wobblies were the radicals. The Wobblies were so radical that if other unions agreed to terms that they felt were insufficiently radical, they would go and picket the other unions, right? The unions would like come to an agreement, they would go to go back to work, and there would be the Wobblies waiting outside the factory going, no, I'm afraid you can't pass a picket line. And they're going, no, it's our picket line, what are you doing? The Wobblies were so radical that they voted to take down their own management hierarchy and have it replaced by a single typist. So the, the Wobblies were the um, single union um, group of... Uh, uh, um, uh, they also had great songs, I should say this. The Wobbly songbook is something you should absolutely... This is how the three people who know about the Wobblies know about it. They all know the songs, and perhaps later we can sing them. Um, so. So the, the, the Wobblies 
had hundreds of thousands. They were incredibly effective as a political force in the, uh, in the 1900s and 20s, um, but they disappeared from American history. And it's not like you know, the trams in Los Angeles. They kind of um, destroyed themselves. What happened was that there was a massive rift in the... Um, uh, in the Wobblies in around about 1924, and it's described as a fight between the centralists and the decentralists. Now you're beginning to see how this links to the internet, right? So um, uh, the centralists wanted to pursue a standard social democratic policy, right? Well, basically the unions would collect funds, they'd form a socialist party in the United States, and they would go on to uh, achieve ends through the existing political system, through reform and uh, the slow expansion of uh, democratic institutions and a social democratic institution. The rest of the Wobblies did really not want to do that, right? The rest of the Wobblies had the position that they wanted to implement the revolution right now, right? They wanted to create the social structures and the radical um, participatory democracy uh, within the union and then expand it to the rest of the world until eventually the world was one whole wide uh, union. That's why they were the in industrial workers of the world. That's what uh, the IWW standed for. They were the worldwide wobblies. See, there is another link. It's all coming together. Um, so this is described in the literature as um, uh, prefigurative politics versus strategic politics, right? Strategic politics is the normal everyday politics of we go and we lobby and we attempt to reform and we attempt to regulate. Prefigurative politics is the idea that my revolution will be dollar value or it will be bullshit. I will create here in the um, shell of the world, um, the, what's the phrase, the build, I will build a new world in the shell of the old. And what happens if you have two different segments of society or part of a, 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 a progressive or revolutionary movement, one of which thinks is you should take a prefigurative mode and one of you thinks you should take a strategic mode, is you end up with nothing particularly in a union environment, because there's no solidarity. Both sides think the other side is, 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 um, is, is doomed. And in fact, it turned out in the 20s that both sides were absolutely correct. The, um, the strategic uh, uh, policy people thought that the radical, um, prefigurative wobblies would fail, and they did, of course, otherwise we, we would all be wearing overalls. Um, and um, the uh, radical prefigurative uh, wobblies felt that the other side would succeed. They would succeed in extending capitalism. Um, they would ex could succeed in breaking the pacifist principles of the wobblies and take the workers supporting a capitalist system into a new, a new era of carnage. And, you know, credit to you, they were both absolutely correct. And because they lost the solidarity, and without solidarity, a union is nothing, we don't know about the wobblies now. All right, so what's my gap? What's my lacuna? Um, I'm, uh, I'm 47, um, which means that I'm one of the last people alive who was born when there wasn't someone on the moon, or bits of stuff on the moon. I'm one of the last people who'll be alive, hopefully, touch wood, with a negative Unix birth date. Okay, I'm born before January the 1st, 19th century. Good, you're going to get the rest of the Unix jokes. Excellent. I'm glad that they're very funny. That's why he likes them. Um, so, uh, here's, 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 my, here's my sort of gap. And actually, I can probably explain this best by showing you. So, I showed you... Um, I showed you, this is sort of the platonic ideal of what we think of when we start a shell, right? It's like this sort of beautiful, scrolling, matrix kind of world. And when I entered um, computing in 1977, so something like that, um, uh, this, this, this is my shell. It's a little bit slower, I apologize, might take up the rest. And you know, it's kind of, it's, it's a bit shit. So, uh, you know, 
obviously, I'm a techno-utopian, you can tell by my glowing laser beam eyes, um, but I have to concede that back then, the internet was not, not even the internet, what am I saying? Bulletin board systems, so it's like anachronism. Um, uh, wasn't very good, and I was very bemused about why this was. As a seven or eight-year-old growing up in the 1970s, I loved computers, but I wanted them to be like Star Trek. I wanted them to be, you know, big. I wanted them to be like nine fridges wide and not just some sort of like strange box um, built by um, some hippies. And um, I, I think this is an important thing to emphasize, right? Like that, that um, if you enter into the world, it, this is annoying too, right? Okay, let me turn it off. Um, oh my goodness, look, it's just going on. Okay, got it. Um, most of the 70s was kind of bad. I mean, particularly TV. Um, so, uh, um, there we go. Can you see there's, there's the Wobblies. There we are. Songs of the Wobblies. We'll be covering that later. Um, there's my shitty terminal. Um, oh, and there are the hippies, right? So this is Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. You've got to remember, as a child growing up in the 70s, the, um, uh, the hippies weren't they were like the thing that people didn't talk about in the 70s, right? For me, like hippies were these creepy people who came and like there was a high risk of them putting face paint on me as a seven-year-old. And like no one would explain why they were around and like what they'd done that made everybody else kind of ashamed that they were still present. Uh, and no one's particularly explained to me why they had all the cool computers. So here's the lacuna. What was happening when I was, uh, you know, just a, a, a tiny dot in my mother's eye? What had I just missed? There, okay. So this is community memory. Who knows about community memory? Awesome, we can, we're going to spend all evening talking about this. So community memory was um, uh, a system set up in Berkeley, um, vaguely connected to the Berkeley free speech movement um, and the uh, Students for a Democratic Society, which were the core of the new left in the United States at the time. Um, and somehow, someone had managed to donate them a mainframe. And they took this mainframe and they created an early internet. They put um, these terminals in public libraries around the San Francisco area and record stores and other sort of like beatnik, hippie, hippie kind of places. And this would be connected together and people would talk and, and leave messages. And this is the connection between um, the new left, the uh, SDS, um, the um, free speech movement, and... Um, the microcomputer revolution. I have this wild fantasy that instead of them donating the computer to the uh, free speech movement people, they donated it to the Black Panthers, who were also operating at the same time. I think we'd have had a very different um, computer revolution, possibly a slightly better one. Yeah, it's like, well, we should run with that, right? I think. Um, anyway, so... Um, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't got a picture of him, but, but the, the person I take as a real inspiration for this particular moment in Silicon Valley's uh, uh, history is Lee Felsenstein. Uh, Lee Felsenstein was simultaneously the person who was a key figure in the free speech movement at Berkeley. Um, he was one of the designers of the software and hardware that operated community memory, and he became the, um, one of the founders and the leaders in a non-hierarchical way of the Homebrew Computer Club, which led to the Apple II and um, uh, the, uh, the first um, popular computer. So, the free speech movement classically, in fact, this is what the books are written about. The books are, are, are there's a great book by Winnie Brines about the prefigurative politics of the SDS and the um, Berkeley political movement, in that they actually refuse to sort of organize and uh, seek out political power because they had the same spirit as the Wobblers. They wanted to create an environment in their own um, way of relating to one another that reflected the idealized society that they wanted to be. They didn't want to create a uh, hierarchical society. Community memory has these great principles of a non 
non-hierarchical, decentralized technology. Um, and that reflected the values of people who wanted to live in their values rather than compromise by interacting with the politics of the day. And the unspoken thing, of course, when I was growing up was, is that that project was perceived to have failed. That the revolutions of the 1960s um, ended um, in uh, factionalism, um, in burnout, and uh, what we were left with was sort of the Bay City Rollers and Evil Knievel. Um, so uh, the, the other interesting thing, of course, is the wing of the political movement who decided to walk away from prefigurative politics um, also did not really succeed in the terms of the 1960s. The new left became um, the, I mean, it's a simple translational mapping, right, became the neoliberals of the Clinton period, and even the neoconservatives came out of the new left, and they became the, 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 the Bush era part of American politics. So this was a situation where both sides of this thing that I'm trying to explain to you, the prefigurative and the strategic, failed in achieving their aims. Except, of course, for these people. So they took out these ideas of the prefigurative politics and almost by accident implemented something that actually had within those terms some kinds of success. And this is why so much of the, the description of that period is freighted in this odd kind of like success of the, the, the radicals rather than sort of a, a product of the military industrial complex or a product of, of, of Silicon Valley venture capitalism. It has this other story that we also know very well of the success of, of, of a politics that aims to be non-hierarchical, aims to be decentralized, aims to be an implementation of the future rather than an attempt to negotiate it. And in those terms, it was an amazing success because it was an existence proof that you could get something out of this that wasn't just a songbook and some happy memories of sitting smoking dope um, in an upstairs garret. Um, so, Let's come back into the room, right? We've, we've, we've covered all of this history, and now we're going to walk into um, 2017. And it doesn't look good for the prefigurative um, success of the, of the politics that you see here. And let's see, I have... Let me just try this again. Kick up the TV. I have this tweet. There we go. It's a little tuned out. I don't know whether you can see this. So it says, me, 2016, burn the system to the fucking ground. Me, 2017, no, not like that. <laughs> and that's where we are, right? We're in a situation where um, uh, bad things are happening. No one really wants to take responsibility. No one, everyone feels that they tried to do their best, um, but, um, but it didn't work out. And in particular, the classic failure of prefigurative politics. The reason why I was uh, um, uh, taken onto this term uh, originally was um, a really great set of essays by um, uh, a guy called Smucker, who's actually been helping a lot of the political movements in the United States now um, combat the threats to civil liberties, liberties and um, uh, basic justice uh, posed by the, uh, the new administration. And um, uh, one of the things that uh, he writes about a lot is the importance of shifting away from this prefigurative frame of mind to strategic politics. And in particular, the critique that he uses is that of Occupy. Occupy is the thing that you'll notice no one talks about in these contexts, right? This is the thing where if you were to come in at this point, no one mentions Occupy, and you sort of go, well, why, what? Why aren't you talking about that? That was only five years ago. Surely there are some lessons to be drawn there. And the lessons that many people have taken is we shan't talk about that anymore. And we need to move to a non-prefigurative way, that there isn't a chance of building a new world in the shell of the old without engaging with the old. Um, and you see this to bring this back in, in, in the area that many of us are involved in, in digital rights and understanding how the internet should play a role in this. Um, 
and uh, there's an understandable shift between throwing up our hands in horror that the decentralized non-hierarchical internet has somehow magically become a world of hierarchies, of harassment, and of vast sort of centralized um, uh, surveillance-driven uh, business models. So the natural tendency to go, okay, let's move into an, uh, a, a stance that isn't about prefigurativeness, a prefiguration, it's about negotiating with these new giants of, um, not of steel, but of, of bits. So uh, a lot of, I mean, dro dropping into you know, my day-to-day -day work pattern, a lot of what I do is spending sort of thinking and talking about regulators in, in Europe who want to understandably control the power of these, these um, centralizing forces. Um, and often, and again, the same thing's true of everybody in, in the digital rights community, of negotiating with those new powers as well, that perhaps we can get them to eliminate fake news a little bit better or, or um, uh, reduce hate speech or change their terms of service or deign to like, reform their, their practice um, through a, a negotiation with, with the rest of us. This is not what prefigurative politics is about. Prefigurative politics would be uh, about burning the system down and then building a new net, Mastodon, decentralized systems, creating networks that could compete or challenge what the network uh, has begun. So I, I sort of promised that I would come up with, with a solution or at least something that would cheer you up. <laughs> um, and, and, I think the conclusion that I've come from looking at all of these things goes back to that, that, that moment in 1924 um, where the wobble is split. Um, because actually you kind of need both. I mean, to be clear, just so you understand, everything I told you was complete nonsense, right? The, the, the narrative that I drew there was a spiraling set of things that probably, I mean, it was all factually true, but in the same way as any other kind of bit of fake news, it's just a narrative that I've weaved to kind of lead you to this conclusion, right? And it's this, I mean, you could imagine Adam Curtis taking the same facts and coming up with exactly the opposite, right? And in fact, he did. And that should make you think a little bit more carefully when you listen to and believe Adam Curtis, right? Because, you know, maybe it's just the English accent that's convincing you. Um, so, but in that narrative, there's like this interesting thing, right? Which is that I've implied that there are these waves and cycles. There's a, a period where the prefigurative viewpoint crests, and then there's another point where strategic politics is, is the moment of the day. And I, 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 it's obviously not true. Like, generations aren't true. The seeds of the old, uh, new world are already existing in the old one. So my kind of lesson in the dying three minutes of this is to say that if you feel yourself in one of these two camps, um, run with it. I'm not going to reveal, though you could probably guess which side I'm on, but in this sort of audience, I imagine that some of us are very tempted to go walk the prefigurative way, to build new tools and to walk away from the negotiations, right? To, to um, um, step into this sort of Silicon Valley or whatever you want to describe it, a model of like building rockets and going off to uh, uh, create a, a, a new world. But others are, are drawn magnetically to Brussels, right? This, this far more realistic model of like, no, that's doomed to failure. We have to build something in the existing political systems because everything's just going to burn down if we don't do that, if we don't hold on to attempting a pragmatic solution with the tools that we find ourselves surrounded with now. And I think the honest truth is that both of those things contain the seeds of the future. Like, both of them are the escape pod for the other one. If this one fails, if, if the negotiations stumble, then we're going to need the prefigurative politics. We're going to need to build these new weapons of liberation. And if this crumbles and falls like it always did, we're going to need people in the room negotiating and, and saving us. But more importantly, these two groups have to show solidarity. These regulating, these sort of negotiations have to keep some room for the prefigurative politicians. And the prefigurative people 
have to stop looking with abject contempt at the sellouts of the strategists. And if we can keep that together, I think there's a, there's a chance that we might be able to ride that, 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 uh, that cycle one more time and maybe just happily have an incremental digital revolution all over again. So, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Danny. Unfortunately, we don't have time for a Q&A, but I'm sure that people can find you next to the stage after the talk, if you have questions, uh, and maybe for a song. Yes, the, the, the song. So do you want to do this? Yeah, okay, go, all right. I, I think this is actually, this we've got a few. How much, how much time will it take? Well, there's 16 verses, so it shouldn't take long. <laughs> um, so, um, go. so we're going to do this because Maciej Czeglowski is going to be speaking in um, stage one, and he's going to be talking about the new unionization of Silicon Valley. And I just thought it would be, we convince him that, like, basically Europe is, like, ready in revolutionary ferment, that he could hear, like, wobblers singing in the room next to them. So, so shall um, we open the door? Um, yeah, open the door. This <laughs> Please is open great. the door. Okay. So, um, do, you, do you guys know the battle hymn of the Republic? <laughs> No, you don't, right? But, but you do know it because American history is wired into our brains by Hollywood terrors, right? So this, that's the one that goes, glory, glory, hallelujah. Ma, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba. So these are the lyrics that we're going to sing. All right? So um, does anybody actually know how? Did, you said you were a wobbly, right? That you read about them. Do you, do you want to lead us in this? So it goes... One, two, three, four. When the union's inspiration through the workers' blood to run, there can be no power great where anywhere beneath the sun. Come Yet on, what guys. force on earth is weaker <laughs> than the feeble strength of one? But, but the, the union, union makes us strong. All together now. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Danny.